Hi, and welcome back to Actions, the Responses to Trafficking podcast. I'm Catherine Baldacchino, and this is a podcast where I speak to people who are working in different ways to respond to trafficking in order to help share their work with other people working in the field. My discussion today is with Amber Cagney, who is the Development Manager of the West Midlands Anti-Slavery Network, about a really important support program for people in the initial stages of leaving exploitation. We spoke in September 2020. So thanks for watching this episode. I hope you enjoy learning from her experience and get in touch with any feedback or further questions via at Actions Podcast on Twitter. Thanks and enjoy. Hi, I am delighted to be joined by Amber Cagney, who is the Development Manager at the West Midlands Anti-Slavery Network and is also a panellist on the Single Competent Authority Multi-Agency Assurance Panels and has worked in various roles across the sector for a number of years. Amber, welcome to the Actions Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's really good to have you. I've been really excited to speak to you. I've been keenly following the work of the network <laughs> and the Safe Place Initiative. So I'm really looking forward to diving into more detail. And before we do, could you start by helping our listeners get to know you better? Can you tell us about yourself, about your current role and what you've done before to get to this point? Yeah, sure. So, um, so my name's Amber. I currently live in Birmingham and work for West Midlands Anti-Slavery Network now as a development manager. Um, a bit about my background. So I um, had quite an interesting route into the sector, actually. Um, so I was born in Dewsbury, um, went to university at Sheffield Hallam, and I actually studied tourism management. Um, and it's always one of those things where someone says, oh, how did you get, what did you study to get into your job? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> the tourism management at uni. Um, but towards like my second and third year, we started looking at topics like international development and um, contemporary forms of tourism. And it covered like dark tourism and sex tourism, which then covered child exploitation um, and how the tourism industry facilitated the trafficking industry via like its ports and then airlines and ships and travel um, hotels um, and I think once I started learning about that I was I was just like how could I want to know anything else <laughs> um, and I had the opportunity uh, then in my final year you can kind of tailor your degree then at that point because you can pick your modules and because one of my lecturers was really quite keen and had a background in this sector I was able to choose a lot of modules linked to human trafficking and um, so we didn't have the word modern slavery back then um, and I did reports on like the links between sport events and the increase of trafficking and um, looking at how to engage airlines in spotting the indicators and prevention and I had the opportunity to do um, be part of a research team with the UK Human Trafficking Centre, the Home Office and Virgin Atlantic, who were training their staff to spot the signs as an airline. And it was quite um, ahead of the time back then, like they were one of the only airlines that were interested and were kind of willing to say this was a problem. Um, so I always came from it from like a research point of view. And then I think it's really common and everybody seems to do this is eventually you're like, I don't want to write and read about it anymore. I want to be involved, I want to do something. Um, so I started volunteering at a safe house, a female safe house for um, the organisation was a subcontractor of the NRM. Um, and I used to just volunteer there once a week and sleep over on a Friday um, and volunteer there on the Saturday. Um, and then an opportunity came up to work there. So I applied for that and then kind of over a period of five years was in different roles from like support worker, caseworker, coordinated and um, supported the setup of a new family accommodation. Um, and then the last role that I was in there was I managed the female accommodation, um, which was split over two safe houses. Um, and then to get to where I am now, so I was really interested in the challenges um, that we faced in the NRM and uh, interested in prevention. I know you get to a point where you think I'm tired of seeing the same challenges I'm tired of seeing people coming through safe houses like what do we need to do to stop stop the flow so how do we stop people from needing this anymore um, and I saw the opportunity at West Midlands to set up a pre-NRM safe house and work on like more prevention and working with partners 
Um, so and one of my like biggest bugbears when I worked in the NRM was the amount of people that would come through and have no idea what modern slavery was or what the NRM was or why they were even where they were. Um, so the opportunity to kind of try and tackle that and make sure people were giving consent to this system that they were going into, it was a great opportunity. So that's kind of 2011 to 2020. <laughs> Fantastic. How interesting. And what an interesting opportunity to be offered this as part of your course in tourism as well, that it actually covers yeah. such a broad um, perspective of, of all the aspects of the tourist and tourism industry. Mm. Yeah, it was good. I think it comes down to the tutors that you have. And if, if you have somebody that has an interest and a background in it, it's it can make it kind of, it, the, I think on slavery and human trafficking links to every sector, doesn't it? So I think any course could fit it in somehow, some way. It's probably really important that they do actually and use that opportunity to start planting that seed in all the students mm -hmm. coming through. Definitely. That's that's great and yeah definitely interested to hear more about the network and about the pilot and the project that you set up as well and really glad that you've already touched on the issues that people face about not even knowing that they're in the NRM um, and the questions around consent and all of that information that people are getting or, or lack of information in the initial stage mm -hmm. so we'll have chance to develop uh, to dig into that deeper shortly um, and in terms of a development manager what does a development manager do what what is part of the <laughs> role um, so I, my role was funded by the Big Lottery as part of um, this pre-NRM project. So they got, they developed this proposal over like two or three years. Um, it was kind of like a big job in the making of getting partners in the network um, to buy into it and support it. And it was, I think there was such a clear gap of where do people go if they're rescued or identified and, you know, how do people get supported in that period before they go into the NRM or if they decide not to. Um, so my role was included in that funding to kind of develop the project plan and set it up from scratch of like what it will actually look like and bring partners together to bring it into fruition. Um, so once that's set up, I now oversee it and the team um, and then develop the organisation kind of in other ways and do training across the West Midlands. So this morning I was training um, modern slavery champions for Birmingham City Council. Um, I've done it in a few different places and go to like police stations and try to kind of influence them and get to get them to see this new sector almost of pre-NRM, this new sphere of kind of best practice. Wonderful, really, really interesting role and clearly yeah, a huge amount of possibility to take the role into you know very different directions uh, mm. so let's talk more about the west midlands anti-slavery network as a whole um, so the network mm -hmm. was one of the first to be set up as i understand it it's had a very long history um, and really has always promoted the importance and the benefit of multi-agency coordination and collaboration across law enforcement civil society uh, statutory authorities and many others across the sector so for the benefit mm -hmm. of those less familiar with the network can you share more about what it does and how it came into being yeah so i've actually pulled the website up in front of me to make sure i definitely get this correct <laughs> um, but so the network has been in existence for um over 10 years now um so you can imagine how ahead of its time it was kind of at its inception um, and it was set up by individuals from the Methodist Church who kind of identified that need for multi-agency working as, you know, no one organisation or no one sector can tackle this alone. So quite early on, it was that, that realisation that people needed to work together cohesively um, rather than in silos. And kind of over the years, um, so the organisation that it was originally was, was broke off into Adavu, which is now its own charity and they work with survivors and then the anti-slavery network formed as its own um, organization um, so our mission statement is to unite and enable partner organizations to work in collaboration to end modern slavery human trafficking and exploitation and we do so by identifying gaps which is kind of how our project became influencing change and facilitating solutions in order to protect and advocate for the vulnerable in society. Um, it's not always easy for organisations to work together, different agendas, different um, perspectives, different ways of working. Um, and I think over the course of the 10 years, the West Midlands is a really good example of how it can work well 
um, it's so much about like relationship building and kind of humanizing what what we go through and what survivors go through to kind of bring people together and I guess that like, the vision for the organization is to be recognized worldwide as leaders in multi-agency partnership to eradicate modern slavery but ensuring that survivors are at the center of everything that we do we never want to kind of be at such a strategic level that we forget the practicality and the reality of what we're dealing with. Yeah, and I'm really glad you touched on the challenges that we can have in engaging across stakeholders because of that real difference in priorities or focus areas or potentially even motivations for being involved in the sector. People come, you know, different organizations are motivated by different strategies and priorities. What are mm. some of the, I guess, tips or, or things that you've learned about um, positive collaboration and ways that they can come together? Mm -hmm. I think, um, obviously I'm quite new to it, I've been here just over a year, um, I think it just comes down to human relationships within different organisations, um, not assuming that, I think assuming the best in other people and realising that we're all, we have all got different agendas but we've all got the same one ultimately like we all want the same thing we all want to be out of a job one day and not have to deal with this anymore because it won't exist um so i think humanizing other agencies and something that we do quite often is even just a conversation between different agencies to be like why don't you sit down with them and talk about it or um instead of talking amongst ourselves in one area of the sector about challenges and be like that's problematic we'll be like okay let's talk to them about it because generally people want to get it right but if we never talk about challenges and we never address them we just moan about it and complain about it and nothing ever changes so i think the way that we've positioned ourselves and because we sit on strategic boards and on the front line level is that we facilitate conversations between people and more often than not people don't know that things are going wrong unless you tell them and i think it's as simple as that sometimes <laughs> But I think just we'd bring people together when they wouldn't normally get the opportunity to do so. Mm. That's really interesting. And I guess part of that is also the opportunity to connect outside of formal meetings then as well and making sure mm. that there is a relationship and a rapport happening outside of formal network gatherings um, on a more regular basis, right? Yeah, so we also do, um, we have a kind of a task group for the services that work directly with survivors so across the west midlands we bring together all the survivor support groups and organizations and charities and we talk about common challenges that we have we have a challenge board um so anybody any even the police can submit or the local authority can submit um so we kind of nail down what is the challenge where is it happening how long has it been happening for and we escalate it up to the strategic board level and get it allocated to somebody and we're like okay let's do something about it um so by being able to make sure that people can if they've got a challenge they can actually raise it and get something done i think people get into see action and things not just staying the way they are it builds trust yeah i can definitely see that and i guess also a common challenge for a lot of people is the amount of time that um, they have to spare which isn't usually not very much but i guess people can really see the benefit of making the time to be involved in in such conversations because actually it's making the rest of their work potentially easier and, and solving a lot of other problems that they're seeing elsewhere yeah i think i think we are very lucky is that we've got people that are very passionate about this area across a number of different sectors so i know sometimes it does rely on one person driving things forward but i think we're we're quite privileged in that within the west midlands in each area and in each organization we've got at least one passionate individual that wants to make change yeah that's really excellent and i know that uh, a lot of new networks that are being set up around the uk often look to the west midlands network as an example of really good practice and ways to sort of adopt or potentially copy with respect the um, the systems mm. and the programs that you've put in place because it is working so well and it does function so effectively yeah there's, de there's definitely no like magic strategy i think it comes with time and trust you know people have to know that it works and that working in partnership is effective because if they think it's just another meeting um they're not likely to engage so you have to see an outcome yeah yeah definitely agree 
Um, so let's now hone in on the Safe Place project, which is a really important development for the anti-trafficking sector, providing support to people when they first leave exploitation. Uh, and I understand that you were involved, as you've mentioned, uh, initially in setting this up. Um, can you detail more about the development and the origins of the project? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, so the network worked with a number of different partners. I think it was West Midlands Police, Birmingham City Council, um, Waits Group and the illegal money lending team and the big lottery and a number of other agencies um, that all kind of bought into this pre-NRM um, area of support. And it was, you know, the realisation that when somebody's first identified or first rescued, if they get put into a B&B, &B, they abscond a lot of the time and the quality of information and advice that's given at that stage is not great and a lot of first responders don't have the confidence to explain what the NRM is well it's really complicated and it can't you know it's not a one-hour conversation that you can just have tick a box and off you go <laughs> um, and I think there's been so many reports you know Hestia I've got some great reports on um, support so our project is for male survivors and they had some great reports on kind of the needs of men um that i think has been like really under researched um and um i've lost my train of thought <laughs> so i think one of their findings was um like the number of survivors that at the point of rescue it wasn't explained what would happen to them to keep them safe or i think it was like 65 percent of them didn't know what the NRM was, I think this was a Black Country Women's Aid report, and just a lot of them just didn't feel safe. So there, there was so much like justification for it, which was great. Um, I think what's been really great for me is that it's something that started from scratch and there isn't really benchmarks for it, other than um, there's a report called the Place of Safety uh, Principles, which has been really integral to setting up and the human trafficking care standards. Um, so to be able to design something from scratch that takes into consideration mistakes made elsewhere and best practice and reflections um, has been great really and we commissioned Survivor Alliance to um, support us with getting feedback from survivors that have been through um, identification and the NRM to give us feedback on kind of if they could have had a place of safety what should it look like um, you know what what do they think it should involve what should it not involve and the feedback that we got from them was so helpful um and like really key part of um what we set up around and i think pretty much every recommendation that we made we were able to adopt it into it um, and it was quite interesting to learn that you know it's less about where they are and it's about the service and the support that they get the training and the understanding of the staff and the team so it meant that when we were writing um job specs um and person specs for the job and the job description we were able to um like design it exactly how it should be and set the standard a bit higher and make sure that people have got good training that come with the job um so it was, it was just really it was had got through a lot of a3 paper and markers and dreaming and creating and which is like my sweet spot really and it was just nice to be able to take into consideration all the reports and all the learning that everybody else has done and my own experiences and just create something that hopefully works <laughs> and is flexible i think because we're an independent organization we're not contracted to anybody else to have kind of results we don't have to see a certain number of people per year we can you know if we saw one person and got the best possible outcome for that one person that would be a success for us um, so kind of having that pressure off and being independent and if something doesn't work we can be like okay we'll change it which we have done many times um, it's just been great that's brilliant and it's really great to hear that survivor alliance were involved as well and so that's really so important and so lacking in so many programs actually having survivors not just involved at the end to give feedback but actually involved mm. in the design and the development of a program uh, so it's truly tailored to, to individual needs yeah i think it has to be i think and even as like as someone working in the sector there's no job satisfaction from running something that doesn't work and that nobody asked for yeah, <laughs> yeah i think i think sometimes too many projects are set up because people think it's what's i remember it's like some when i used to do casework i always used to think like how do i know what i'm doing is right 
and the import and you've got to be communicating with survivors you've got to be getting feedback and evaluations and being like is this what you want what do you think and because they know themselves best the same way that I know myself best and if nobody asked me what I want in my care and support I would just think why would I enter it you know it's an adult service they've got to consent to it it's they can withdraw at any time so it's got to be designed for them in mind absolutely and can you describe what the journey is for people entering the service so where will they have been initially and then how do they enter the service and then what happens afterwards as they travel through it yeah um so we originally set the plan was originally that it'd be five days of support um but kind of as it was being developed and the amount of support and services that they would need to access we kind of we increased up to, up to 10 days um, and it was set up in partnership with West Midlands Police, so they refer into us, um, but we've kind of further developed that so that Warwickshire Police can refer to us and the GLAA. Um, so we get direct referral from organisations that have identified people. Um, and usually it comes off the back of like organised raids or um, reception centres or, or sometimes, you know, we, we had a referral where somebody was found by accident on another job <laughs> and it just came, and it came about so it's referral only um, we once we get the referral through from the agency our advice and advocacy coordinators go out to conduct an assessment with that person just like an initial risk assessment um, understand kind of what their immediate needs are the risk of being um, pursued by their perpetrator to make sure that where we're located is suitable um, and just explain what our service is um, as well so that they know and they can actually consent to coming to us as well um because we we don't we really strongly believe that people need the time and space to process what's happened to them before they we even tackle what the nrm is and start unpicking that you know it's such a you know people are being put into the nrm when they've not slept for three days and you know where's the consent in that um so kind of explaining what the process will be how long they're going to come to us for uh so then they come to our house it's a three-bedroomed house um that's it's really nice if i do say so it's furnished really well uh it's just a really nice relaxing place to be um so the we do a detailed needs based assessment with that person and basically ask them what do they want from this day like what what they want to get out of this and um we've got connections with our local gp so we can make sure we can get an appointment within 24 48 hours if they need it um and that was something that we worked with public health in england with to make sure that we could access that um and we can we've got links with legal providers so if they want some advice before they decide to go into the nrm whether that's criminal advice immigration advice anything specific um but mainly it's just about slowing everything down um there's no by day two you have to have done this or by day five you need to have done this it's if they want to sleep for three days straight then go for it and making sure they've got food to eat and um, they can access a shower um, clothing like all the basic needs are met um, and then it's kind of just led by them like making sure that we go through the NRM and what modern slavery is multiple times until they can retain that information and kind of make a decision based on what their other options are so our staff are trained and have got backgrounds in um, of various different sectors and they can take them to citizens advice if they need it and it's just about putting all the options on the table depending on what their circumstances are and trying to encourage them to make a decision within 10 days and supporting and advocating them to move on that sounds incredible and um what are the outcomes that you would hope to achieve um during this this sort of 10-day window so we've got um like five key performance indicators and I always forget one when I reel them off but I'll try and remember <laughs> um, but our main aim is that they they leave feeling better than they did when they first came like we never want to end up with someone where they think gosh I wish I was back where I was so like they always have to, we always want to make sure that they leave just feeling better so one of our indicators is feelings of safety we want to make sure that somebody like not based on a risk assessment not based on what the police say or what we say what safety is that they feel safer as a result of being there 
um, that their health and well-being has improved so that they've they understand how they can access health in the future and they've accessed health and well-being support services during their time um, they understand their rights and entitlements as a potential victim of modern slavery or any other crime that's been committed against them um, and in relation to their immigration status um, they've got a, a safe exit um, and, and these, these KPIs are mainly based on um, their ECAT entitlements anyway, it's because we've not plucked it out of thin air. Um, wherever they decide to go to it, it's safe and they know where they're going and they understand what happens next. Um, and that, I, can't, I can never remember the fifth one, I think it's integration or community and services, that they understand the other services involved in their care and that they're linked into somebody else so that we don't step out and there's no one else mm. there. Great. Good memory. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've probably got that wrong. <laughs> Hopefully not. And what do you find that people do choose after they've had the chance to rest, to really think about their options? What are the options that people are selecting as a move on after that? So all of our service users so far have gone into the NRM. Um, it has taken multiple times of explaining the process and what they will go through to get there and what that means for them, what it could mean for them in the future. I would say everybody that we've had has needed it explaining to them several times over a course of multiple days. Um, some have needed legal advice before making that choice, but all, all of ours so far have gone into the NRM. Um, but we have, we've made sure that we've got connections with um, other accommodation providers across the West Midlands that can take no recourse put to public fund spaces or like fast track spaces so that if they decided against it, they've got just as much accessibility elsewhere as well. Great, because often we see that people might consent to the NRM for lack of any other alternative. So the fact that you have alternatives lined up truly mm. makes it fully informed and actual consent then when they do agree to enter the NRM. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even if their only, if their choice is I want to go back to being street homeless, the staff know which organisations they contact to make sure that the homeless teams know that they exist. They've got somewhere to sleep. They've got the, the things that they need. Hopefully that nobody would choose that choice not to like push our own kind of expectations onto people. But no matter what choice somebody makes, we will try and make it as safe um, and secure as possible. Yeah. But I think that's that's the key thing, isn't it? Is that a lot of the time people NRM referrals are put in because other professionals deem that their their NRM is their only option, but it's just not the case. And there are other services out there. Um, it's just making sure that they know that they are out there mm -hmm. if that's not what they want. Yeah, absolutely. And we often hear about three days of support, and that is what's going to look as if we're on the cusp of having that part of the victim care contract going forward. Um, uh, so what is your um, take on the three days and what are, what are you usually able to do within three days, um, considering also that then people get an extra week after that within your service? Yeah, I don't know where three days has come from, <laughs> um, to be honest. I don't know, kind of, I've not heard what the justification for that is or what the expectation of support will look like. And I think, you know, it's another reason why our independence is important to us because we don't dictate things by days we had somebody that stayed with us for 16 days because that's how long they needed it's, we can be flexible with it um i think i imagine pre NRM services that our three days will look very different to what ours looks like you know ours is designed specifically for the gaps and the challenges that we've identified um and we know that people need health they need to see a gp they need to go to hospital they need support with um drug and alcohol you know, to go into the NRM, you need to have a prescription for um, rehabilitation. Like, if you're um, if you've been taking drugs and you've got an addiction, in order to access a subcontractor, you have to have a prescription, and that prescription has to be transferred to where you're going to. That definitely <laughs> takes more than three days to even get an appointment to be able to do that. So, you know, our time is based on the reality and the practicality of accessing other services. Um, um, but I imagine that if it is two to three days this what support will be will just be very stripped back to the bare minimum um i think anything is better than somebody being told what the nrm is and an hour later the form going in i think you know some we can complain about things all the time and uh, demand better and we always will 
I think we have to kind of um, I am glad that two to three days will come in and it helps us when we're justifying this area of support to services and first responders when we can say the Home Office have said people should have three days before that form goes in because we we're hearing um, people getting the form put in before they even know the form's been put in <laughs> so they're on like minus time so I think three days is good to start with I think what will happen is they realize that three days is not enough and I'm hoping that that will build and develop when they realize actually the practicality you know you can't even get an RG in three days you get an RG in five days um, to get support if there's no capacity in subcontractors it takes as long as it takes mm. so I think there's a difference between what somebody suggests and the reality of how long things take <laughs> yeah and, and about the point that we mentioned earlier about being survivor led and really being tailored mm. around individual journeys and individual needs and some people just needing definitely to take longer to do that. Mm. It would be really interesting over time even to track the outcomes for survivors as they exit the NRM then, because as you're saying, with enough time so far, all the people in the service have consented to enter the NRM. And that mm -hmm. suggests also that given the amount of time that you have with people, the quality of the forms that go in is going to be a lot higher because you've had a lot more time to collect and collate that information. So potentially even the quality of decision making down the line um, is going to be vastly improved. Is that something you're already seeing or something you expect to see? I think what we didn't realize when we first set up was that the pre-NRM space is a whole project in itself um, and getting first responders to understand why that area that period of support is important um, and that has required us to go out to first responders and deliver training on care standards and consent and quality of NRMs um, and it's become like a whole other thing in itself that you know you can't just set up a place of safety and expect people to use it they have to understand why they need to understand why it's important um, and, you know, we are gathering plenty of evidence that suggests, you know, slowing things down and putting time and effort into the NRM form is beneficial. Um, you know, we had one case where the NRM form had been submitted before they came to us and it got a negative reasonable grounds decision because there was about three sentences on it. And our staff were able to then sit down with the first responder and say, you know, this is what an NRM form should look like. This is the level of detail that you need. This form can impact somebody for the rest of their life. If they're an asylum seeker, this form can impact like a life or death decision. If they fear persecution in their home country, you know, if there's incorrect information in this form, it can result in somebody not being granted asylum status. You know, I've seen NRM decisions and asylum decisions in the past where that initial form is the basis of credibility for the rest of their claim. So trying to get them to understand that, you know, it's not just a tick box exercise. The NRM form is an in incredibly important stage of recovery for somebody and it can make a massive difference. Um, I've lost my train of thought of what, what, what point I was making. Um, but, um, yeah, but, you know, training has needed to come alongside it. Yeah. Um, and, it, we have seen an improvement in NRM forms and that quality of information, you know, and learning from if you don't do it, they're not necessarily going to get a positive RG, which means you're back at square one. And where is this person going to go? And thankfully, they were with us and we knew how to put a reconsideration in and eventually it became a positive decision. But if we weren't here, the first responder didn't know what a reconsideration was that, that you can do that and and i think as you said before like that the where do they go afterwards mm -hmm. like the longevity of the journey and part of the project is that we follow up with people and give them a ring a few months down the line and say are you still in the nrm like how are things do you need any support um and we've just recently got a new role in the west midlands um that's hopefully going to kind of like similar to like marac for domestic violence and the passage who are doing something similar in Wales that have got a Marac, like tracking that journey over a period of time and making sure that outcomes for survivors are actually working and going into the NRM and is, are they coming back or where are they going afterwards? Have they gone back into exploitation? Because you can send hundreds of people into the NRM, but that doesn't necessarily mean success. Mm. It doesn't mean that they're safe or that their life is better as a result. Absolutely. And it will be so interesting to see what those outcomes, those longer term outcomes and impacts are on people. And I think because yeah. I guess such a wraparound service could 
could be very time consuming and could potentially also cost um, a lot as well. But actually there's mm. such a justification for why you almost need to front load that intensive support because ultimately it's saving a lot of time and a lot of extra interventions, potentially unnecessary interventions down the line in order to make reconsiderations or to prevent homelessness or other things that happen after people leave the NRM. Yeah, I think being on the multi-agency assurance panel um, is eye-opening. Because um, obviously when I've worked in the NRM, you can you don't always see the NRM form, um, depending on whether it's on the file or not. But being on the panel, you see the NRM form that came in and you get to see the decision-making process and how that NRM form informs that process and where it contradicts with other information or is used as... Because there's only two reasons why somebody gets a negative decision this lack of evidence or credibility and being able to kind of see that side and how an NRM form can influence a decision massively and being able to advocate for that in the early stage. And so it's about prevention, isn't it? And like, I think our, our um, staff in the safe house in the project, they work when somebody we've got services in, they work so hard. They are working um, like constantly and advocating and work, working so hard for this person. There's so much time and support that goes in early. So it's almost like bizarre to know that there's, that doesn't exist half the time or 95% of the time. So it's, mm. I think once you start to unpick things and be like, oh, actually this needs to be done better. You could be improving it for the rest of your life, couldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for other organizations who might be thinking about setting up something similar, um, obviously there's a lot to consider. What would be the top line kind of pieces of advice that you would want to really raise that people must consider when they're setting this up? Yeah, I have had a few phone calls with organizations that are wanting to set up um, and I am always willing to, to chat to people and talk about kind of how we've done things and the early stages of that. Um, I think the reputation of the network is why we got the funding in the first place. Um, the work that has gone in prior to this being set up and the multi-agency work and the support that we have from other agencies is why we got the funding and because we had the trust that we could deliver. Um, we haven't set this up as three team members in the network. We've set it up as a partnership. You know, West Midlands Police heavily supported with it. Birmingham City Council heavily supported it. So the buy-in from other agencies and the support of them has been essential. Um, and I think using the care standards as like we call it the Bible, <laughs> it's um, every staff member has got a copy and it's highlighted and it's a beautiful document. Um, like the care standards is the baseline of any project that should be set up and getting survivor input. I think those four things, yeah, I don't think you can, like, obviously you've got the health and safety, you've got the risk assessments, you've got the insurance, you've fire alarms and all the nitty gritty. Um, but there's so much research out there already. There's so many documents on best, best practice. There's almost no excuse for not using it. Um, so, but just, I don't think one service can do it alone. You know, we've had support. I mentioned earlier from Public Health England to make sure that our survivors can access health. We've had support from the police to make sure that they can get a first responder to put that form in and support them if they want to report to the police. Support from the council and the homeless teams and you know it's it's a multi-agency job. It's not something you can do in a silo or if you do it you probably won't get the best outcomes for the people you work with. Great, that is really helpful and really insightful and so great to pick your brain about your experience <laughs> in this. Uh, and I'm sure others will be keen to get in touch with you. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for for now. I'm sure we could speak at much greater length uh, about this really important work. If anybody does want to get in touch or to find out more, what should they do? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, so you can go to our website, um, which is westmidlandsantislavery.org and we've got a contact us section on there so you're welcome to um, go via there or it's amber.cagney at westmidlandsantislavery.org um, you're welcome to drop me a line and we can have a chat but I love talking about it and all I do in my spare time is read documents I'm a very boring person I've got the like statutory guidance printed out and I'm excited to highlight it it's 
what I do for fun. <laughs> so I never get bored of talking about it. So it, won't, it doesn't pass to me to talk. <laughs> so that's a big invitation to get in touch with you <laughs> for more information uh, and we'll include all of that information including amber's email address in the show notes both for the audio and the visual podcast so that will be available for everybody so thanks so much for taking the time to speak to me amber it was really really great to spend this time together and to chat through your work thank you for having me thank you for having me and no problem thank you also to the listeners for tuning in and until the next one goodbye You've been listening to Actions, Responses to Trafficking podcast. Music used in this episode is Inspiration, written by Rayful Crux and sourced from freepd.com. Actions is produced and presented by Catherine Baldacchino.